The final item of business is members' business debate on motion 15889 in the name of Emma Harper on Eating Disorders Awareness Week. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please. And I call on Emma Harper to open the debate for around seven minutes. Thank you, President Officer. February 25th through to March the 2nd marks Eating Disorders Awareness Week for this year, 2019. The theme this year is tackling discrimination and breaking down the stereotypes associated with eating disorders. And I'd like to start by thanking my colleagues across chamber who have signed my motion, allowing us to have this important date, the debate to raise awareness of eating disorders this evening. For many years, this debate was proposed by former MSP Dennis Robertson, who still champions this issue, and I'm happy to continue to bring it to the Scottish Parliament. And I remind Chamber that Claire Hawkey led this debate last year. My motion states that there are approximately 1.25 million people across the UK who have an eating disorder, and last year in Scotland, 536 people were treated for an eating disorder. I would like to acknowledge the charities that are instrumental in supporting many people across Scotland and the rest of the UK, the Scottish Eating Disorders Interest Group, as well as the charity BEAT. And I welcome members of BEAT to the gallery and those watching online today. They provide support uh, that's absolutely vital for families, professionals and people who are seeking advice, help and support with the many challenges faced by someone either at risk of developing or ha who has been diagnosed with an eating disorder. The info they provide on the web is very valuable and I would encourage people to access the sites to see for themselves what information is out there. There's research that's been posted by BEAT on Monday this week, which states that stereotypes about who gets an eating disorder prevents BAME, LGBT+, and people from less affluent backgrounds from seeking and getting medical treatment. And I'd like to focus my speech this evening on the need to tackle stigma surrounding eating disorders and the announcement on Monday from the Scottish Government to better improve the way we support and treat those presenting with eating disorders as well as the need for continued research into and support for people living with diabulimia. Presiding officer, the definition of an eating disorder is when someone develops an unhealthy attitude towards food. This can take over their life and make them very ill. There are various forms of eating disorders from anorexia, where people try to keep their weight as low as possible by not eating or over-exercising, or bulimia, where people can lose control and eat a lot of food in a very short amount of time and they're deliberately sick, as well as others such as binge eating and there are non-specific eating disorders as well. The key symptoms of these disorders include excessively worrying about weight and body shape, avoiding social situations where food may be involved, frequently visiting the toilet after meals and returning maybe perhaps looking a bit flushed, and not being upfront about particular food that may be consumed. And it is important for family members, friends and colleagues to be aware of these signs. Research has shown that there is a link between eating disorders and depression, low confidence and low self-esteem. Presiding officer, I'd like to touch on the relationship between social media use and eating disorders in young people. Social media sites allow today's youth the opportunity to connect with others in multiple platforms and venues, which is great as it allows connections to be made as well as the sharing of ideas, knowledge and information. However, I am sure that all of us in Chamber will be aware that social media can also be a dangerous platform for hate and discrimination. And because engaging in various forms of social media has become a routine activity for adolescents today and indeed adults as well, it is important to consider how it has impacted on young people at risk of developing eating disorders. Seeing dieting ads or frequently being exposed to images that may provoke body image concerns can have a damaging and da dangerous impact on young people, particularly those who are at risk of developing an eating disorder. It may be as high as 12% in girls that has, uh, research has suggested and is increasingly recognised in males as well. Yes, of course. I wonder, Shona Robson. Uh, agree with me that there is a real responsibility on celebrities 
not to uh, promote products which uh, are dangerous, uh, for, particularly for, for women and young girls? And would she agree that the Advertising Standards Authority should definitely look into this area to restrict it? Emma Harper. I thank Shona Robinson for that intervention. That is actually a, a, a great point that you've made. So I would encourage the Adver Stan Advertising Standards Authorities to be uh, to look into this. And I would agree that uh, people who are um, like personalities out in the media system are responsible as well in promoting certain products. So thank you for that intervention. Social media interactions are often an extension of an adolescent's life. So being aware of online use and the issues that children today may be facing online is an important part of what we have to do. And I would ask the Scottish Government to keep this in mind when overseeing the development of any proposed guidance. I was pleased to see the announcement from the Minister on Monday confirming that the Scottish Government will ask the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network, SIGN, to introduce new guidelines to support the treatment and care of people living with eating disorders in Scotland. I was particularly pleased to see that these guidelines will focus on Scotland's unique cultural and geographical makeup, which will seek to better improve services in our remote and rural communities, such as in De Vries and Galloway in my South Scotland region, where people may experience greater difficulties in accessing specialist treatment. Indeed, when my office contacted the dietetic team at NHS De Vries and Galloway yesterday, it was confirmed that because of the rurality of De Vries and Galloway, some people who are at risk of developing an eating disorder may not be picked up as easily or may be reluct reluctant to access support because of the travel involved in attending appointments. I highlighted this in my contribution to eating disorders debate last year, so I'm pleased to see the Scottish Government take on board these asks, which I raised on behalf of my constituents. Additionally, I'm pleased to see the Scottish Government's announcement will not purely focus on young people and will also look to better inform clinicians on best practice when dealing with adults presenting with eating disorders. I would also like to acknowledge Diabetes UK as well as Diabetes Scotland, who have carried out a great deal of work with both at the Diabetes Cross Party Group and as co-chair, I've become quite familiar with many of the issues uh, presented, as well as sponsoring parliamentary receptions. Diabetes UK and Diabetes Scotland have worked to raise awareness and understanding of diabulimia. That's a term used among the diabetes community. And although it has not officially been recognised by the ICD, the International Classification of Disease Index, it is a very real eating disorder. Diabulimia refers to a person with type 1 diabetes who purposely reduces their insulin dose or omits their insulin to control their weight. Many, many years ago, when grown up with type 1 myself, I knew a young woman who died of the condition and I was only aware that she had just stopped taking her insulin because she thought she was too heavy. Current research has shown that people with this condition have a much shorter lifespan. It can lead to severe diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA, which is severe high blood glucose levels, which can be fatal if not treated by medical professionals requiring an, ac an acute hospital admission. It can also cause complications of diabetes, such as retinopathy, neuropathy, and nephropathy. It is difficult to diagnose and is extremely complex. People with diabulimia require mental health support as well as the physical, medical needs associated with diabetes. Like any eating disorder, it is a mental health issue, so healthcare professionals and the family and friends of those with type 1 diabetes should be aware that signs could indicate diabulimia. They suggest that this might be weight loss or fluctuation in weight, regular symptoms of high blood glucose levels, secrecy over or fear of injections, maybe reluctance to be weighed, lack of blood glucose monitoring or a reluctance to monitor, and an encyclopedic knowledge of nutritional composition of foods. I would also like to ask the Scottish Government what guidance and support it is able to provide me to engage with ICD to support the diagnosis of diabulimia as a standalone illness as it is my understanding that ICD are responsible for recognising health conditions in Scotland. I would also like to commend the work of the Children and Young People's Mental Health Task Force, chaired by Dr Dame Denise Coya, who has created an ambitious plan to support the needs of children and young people to help address their needs when facing issues around diet, exercise and the challenges that they face in tackling their eating disorder. 
The ambitious plan by the Scottish Government means that our young people get the right treatment in the right place at the right time. And I look forward to seeing further guidance on this. In conclusion, I'd like to welcome the Scottish Government's recent announcement of a package of measures to support better eating disorders, in particular to improve specialist services for people living in our remote and rural areas. And again, I would like to reiterate my ask for this Government to support engagement with ICD to explore options of getting diabulimia recognised as a standalone condition. And I look forward to hearing the contributions from everyone else this evening. Thank you. Thank you. We move to the open debate. I was going to say speeches of four minutes, but I guess you can have as long as you like. <laughs> so, and I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Let's all get comfortable. Um, can I thank Emma Harper for bringing this debate to the Chamber and giving us the opportunity to draw attention to the serious and growing issue, I think, of, of eating disorders. Now, I'm in a fairly unique position in that I have three daughters uh, born roughly a decade apart, uh, and I'm very aware, of, very aware of, of the concerning change in language uh, around uh, body self-awareness. Um, I have a, my, my youngest is, is coming up in 11, and hearing some of the conversations that she has with uh, some of her friends does worry me, it does concern me. Um, I, I said down, the, down the, the running track, I heard her talking to one of her friends, or one of her friends talking to her, saying the words, do you think I'm fat? And I'm looking at her going, you're a stick insect. And the reply was, well, you're not as fat as me. And I think that, that, that that's a kind of language that, that to me is quite, is developing and is, and is a worry. I have to say, I first became aware uh, of uh, eating disorders while I was uh, still a competing athlete, and uh, there was a female long-distance runner diagnosed with anorexia. And I've got to say, that, that, that's something I, I could not get my head around, because when I wasn't training, I was eating. I was trying to cram 4,000 calories down my throat uh, every day, which is, which is quite difficult to do, and, and, I, and I wasn't a, a long-distance athlete. So, I couldn't understand how you could be an international athlete and not be conscious of, of the amount of calories you have to eat. And, it, and it's around that idea it, 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 that kind of overtakes you, um, as, as I, I understand, of, of the need to carry as little weight around the track as they possibly can. And that then develops into, into a condition. And as I said, she became uh, anorexic. But it's brought closer to home with me uh, when I began to suspect a, a sort of close family member of having bulimia. And the telltale signs, you, you know, I'm sure everybody aware, you, you see some splatterings in the, in the, uh, in the toilet pan. And, and I, you know, ill-equipped as I was uh, to deal with this, I did, I did ask the question, is, is, is there something they need to talk to me about? And uh, it didn't happen quickly. But eventually, they actually wrote a letter and handed it to me, rather than speak to me to start. And I, I, I found that uh, massively distressing, because the, the issue of handing me a letter was because they thought that I would be disappointed in them, and somehow that they'd let me down. And I think that speaks to the mental health issue that, that, that surrounds uh, uh, eating disorders, that, that feeling that, 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 uh, uh, that they're not worthy. Uh, of your help. And, and I think, so th this, this debate gives us the opportunity to, to bring that kind of, of, of issue forward. And fortunately, you know, it, it, you know it, we, we caught that particularly quickly and managed to, to, to solve that problem. But that has always stuck, stuck with me, that, that um, the, the, their way they're ment they, they mentally considered the issues that they had and were unable to bring that to me uh, except in the form of handing me a letter. And I think that, that, that to me, has uh, uh, brought this home to me. And also, as, as co-convener of the Diabetes uh, Cross-Party Group on Diabetes, I, I became aware of a diabolemia condition uh, uh, through uh, uh, that, being aware of that. And I think given the potential outcome of not keeping your insulin levels uh, uh, at a reasonable uh, level is something we need to talk about. And we need to keep that in the public eye, uh, not least to highlight the risks. Uh, because as, as Emma Harper has quite rightly uh, stated, you can die 
uh, from this condition. So I will conclude, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, where I started, and it's around the language we use in and around our children, about body shape and, and the expectations that that throws up. Deputy Presiding Officer, it's, uh, I think what we need to do, we need to change the language and we need to change the conversation because this is a growing issue. And once again, I'd like to thank Emma Harper for giving us the opportunity to bring this to the Chamber. Deputy Presiding Officer. Rona Mackay, followed by James Dornan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank my colleague, Emma Harper, for bringing this important debate to the Chamber. And I'm pleased to be able to contribute tonight. Uh, because most of us will know someone who's suffered from an eating disorder and the heartache it causes them, their family and friends. Presiding Officer, the misery caused to the individual sufferer is immense, but the pain felt by family members must be overwhelming. Imagine watching your loved one inflicting such an amount of self-harm that their lives are endangered and you have to look on helpless. As Emma Harper said, a former MSP colleague, Dennis Robertson, knows only too well of this pain. And although I didn't know Dennis, my thoughts are with him and his family. Many decades ago, two of my school friends suffered from anorexia nervosa throughout their teens, and I spoke of them last year when I took part in this debate. During that debate, we highlighted the immensely damaging culture, glorifying thinness, resulting in body dissatisfaction, which mainly affects young girls and which has devastating effects. And I also echo Emma Harper's comments about the influence of social media nowadays. Um, in 2017 to 18, 536 people across Scotland were treated for an eating disorder. And studies tell us that eating disorders in teenage girls may be as high as 12%, and that male eating disorders are alarmingly increasing. So what are eating disorders? The most common conditions are anorexia nervosa, bulimia, and binge eating. 40% of those affected by a disorder are bulimic. Eating disorders are more common in young women, but there's been a 76% rise in middle-aged women. So what can be done to re reverse this trend and start making a difference? Research suggests that the earlier eating disorder tr treatment is sought, the better the sufferer's chance of recovery. Presiding officer, these disorders are rarely about food or thinness. Instead, these unhealthy behaviours are coping mechanisms for stress and overwhelming emotion. That's why early access to mental health services and, appro and appropriate treatment is crucial. As we've heard, um, well, I'm pleased that the Scottish Government has announced new guidelines for doctors to support the treatment and care of patients with eating disorders. The announcement marks the start of Eating Disorders Awareness Week 2019, a campaign organised by a national eating disorders charity, BEAT, who do a marvellous job in highlighting awareness and reducing the stigma of eating disorders. The theme... Yes. Neil Finlay. Member just uh, mentioned there about uh, early intervention. I wonder what our view is on the length of time that patients wait for access to treatment. Rona Mackay. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I, I totally agree that that's not good enough. And I think um, it's something that really do, it has to be addressed. And I hope that the new, the new measures the government are bringing in will address that because it is absolutely fundamental. Um, the, the, the theme for this year's uh, awareness week is tackling discrimination and breaking down the stereotypes associated with eating disorders. So the new guidance will focus on the unique cultural and geographical makeup of Scotland, which includes remote and rural parts of the country where there may not be access uh, to specialist treatment. It will also give clinicians more advice in supporting patients with medical complications associated with disorders, and the guidance will include a version uh, for parents and, uh, patients and carers. So the focus is on early intervention, um, and it ensures better access to services as part of the Scottish Government's 10-year uh, mental health strategy, backed by investment of 150 million over the next five years. Um, and I sincerely hope that that does um, um, make the waiting times a lot uh, shorter, because the current levels are, are not acceptable. Um, presiding officer, these guidelines aim to improve the care that people receive, improve services, provision and outcomes across all of Scotland. And I hope that this gives sufferers and their families some comfort and hope. Thank you. James Dornan, followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you, presiding officer. As Emma Harper's co-convener of the Cross-Party Group for Mental Health, I'm grateful to her for securing today's very important and timely debate. As we've heard, we're in the middle of a Eating Disorders Awareness Week 2019, a campaign expertly organised by the charity BEAT, 
and it acts as a great opportunity for society to reflect on how we can better support those who live with an eating disorder. This year's Awareness Week also sadly coincides with the heartbreaking anniversary of Car Caroline Robertson, the daughter of my former S MSP colleague and now councillor Dennis Robertson. My thoughts throughout this whole week are with Dennis and his family, and I hope they take comfort in the fact that MSPs across party divides are continuing Dennis's parliamentary campaign to improve mental health services, particularly for those living with eating disorders. Presiding officer, eating disorders are more devastating and more common than people may actually be aware. Anorexia has the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric disorder, whilst Pete estimates that approximately 1.25 million people in the United Kingdom live with an eating disorder. In 2017, the last full year with available published statistics, 923 people across Scotland were diagnosed with an eating disorder. Of this, 214 were diagnosed in the health board, which serves my Glasgow Cathcart <laughs> constituency, NHS, Greater Glasgow and Clyde. And I myself have been contacted by constituents living with anorexia nervosa just over the last year. There's a massive disparity in the number of estimated people living with an eating disorder compared to those who come forward for help. So this vindicates the need to further tackle stigma and stereotype. Indeed, by their nature, eating disorders are secretive and st stigmatised. We know how hard it can be for people to ask for treatment, and it's even harder if a person doesn't meet the expectations of what a person with an eating disorder should look like. Stereotypes would have you believe that eating disorders are not serious illnesses, and they always take the same form that only white, middle-class women and girls suffer. Frankly, these stereotypes are dangerous. They discourage people from seeking help, make it less likely for employers and in some cases healthcare professionals to take them seriously as they should and it also makes them harder to be spotted by the sufferer or a loved one. Eating disorders are serious mental illnesses that can have severe psychological, physical and social consequences and they should never be downplayed as being diets gone wrong or lifestyle choices. I therefore congratulate the work of the third sector organisations like Beat and SEDIG, the NHS and the Scottish Government who are resolute in their commitment to eradicate stigma. As members will be aware, I'm sure I consistently make the case for this parliament and the public to speak about and tackle female injustice, but I hope on this occasion members will understand that I want to appeal to men and boys. I fully appreciate that eating disorders most commonly affect young women. However, some studies suggest that up to a quarter of sufferers are male. I've seen for myself recently the concerns some men have around their body shape, and it's increasingly concerning, particularly around young males. The stigma around eating disorders and around male sufferers means that we can't say for certain how many men go undiagnosed. However, male eating disorders are increasingly being recognised. What is certain is that if you're male and worried about yourself, you're not alone. There are many men who share your experience. So please speak out and make sure that someone knows that you've got these concerns. Presiding officer, since last year's debate, I'm delighted to see the Scottish Government undertake real progress in improving the support available to people with eating disorders. This is a specific pro support which goes over and above the other steps taken to improve mental health services more generally. First of all, through the peer-to-peer -peer support service, which was relaunched yesterday after a trial period in NH Lozu. And secondly, through the announcement on Monday that new guidance will be produced by SIGN to give clinicians in Scotland more specific support for the treatment and care of patients with eating disorders. These are very positive steps forward and have been warmly welcomed by health professionals and eating disorder charities over the last few days. In summing up, presiding officer, I'd like to add that I have full support in this government to drive the necessary changes to improve the support available to those with eating disorders. It won't be an easy task, but things are certainly improving. Our current Minister for Mental Health, Claire Hockey, as was mentioned by Emma Harper, led this very debate last year, so she'd be well aware of the challenges which lie ahead, but I'm sure she will meet them head on. Thank you. Neil Finlay, followed by Gillian Martin. Uh, thanks, President Officer. I thank Emma Harper for bringing the debate forward. And I, I declare an interest that my daughter is an occupational therapist who works with people with eating disorders. Um, members uh, have spoken about the numbers of people in Scotland and the UK who suffer from an eating disorder and that these are people of all ages, genders and backgrounds, although we do know that women and girls are, are disproportionately affected. And these are people with serious mental health conditions that, in far too many cases, uh, are fatal. I think anorexia has one of the highest fatality rates of any mental illness. And the impact uh, that we see on individuals can be devastating with the ripple effect on loved ones, multiplying the impact of that several times over. I cannot begin to imagine the pain of watching a daughter or son or partner 
or sibling dying because uh, they do, want, do not want to eat or take in nutrition. Uh, of course, many people develop a mental illness because of previous trauma in their life, be it abuse or violence or substance misuse, bullying, neglect, or some other trauma. Uh, and, President Officer, uh, I'm taking part in this debate because of constituents who have come to me who suffer from an eating disorder, but also because, yes, my daughter, but also a close friend, uh, work as specialist OTs in this field, and uh, hearing from them about their work is very, very illuminating. And they all point to, and as people have mentioned it, early intervention is the key factor on the path to recovery. Yet eating disorders uh, and other mental health conditions are subject to, I think it's an 18-week treatment time guarantee. I have to say, that is not early intervention by any stretch of the imagination. And I hope, I genuinely hope the Minister will address that very serious and specific point in her speech. Uh, can you imagine seeing a loved one in crisis and being told that you won't be seen for another four and a half months? Uh, there are no targets in place to support this work in the NHS. Um, the government regularly and likes to point to England for a whole range of comparators when it suits the argument. So if we look at what's happening in England, there all people under 18 with an eating disorder should receive specialist treatment within four weeks. Four weeks. And in urgent cases within one week. Compare that to what's happening here and we see a stark difference. Yes, I will. Claire Hockey. I thank Mr Finlay for taking an intervention. If I could just clarify for him that uh, all CAMS children and adolescent mental health services triage referrals. So if young people are referred in crisis, they can be seen same day or next day. So not everyone is put onto a, uh, a, a, an 18 week, 18 week uh, waiting list target. Neil Finlay. I think the very important word you used there was can, because certainly I am sure and this is not a party political comment in any way, but the reality is that MSPs of all parties in their caseload will have constituents coming to them who have children with real mental health crisis who cannot get access to therapy and treatment. And that is the reality of the situa situation. We can all go back to waiting times and what should happen, but the reality on the ground is many people are not getting access to treatment and anywhere near the description that the Minister says. Uh, people in our constituencies are waiting far too long for specialist treatment, and this is people in desperate need. So we should be looking at replicating these better standards that we see elsewhere for people uh, of all ages. I know from my previous training as a teacher that my education on mental health awareness, and, for example, and most certainly on eating disorders, uh, was almost non-existent in my training, despite the fact that I was going to be working with children and adolescents. Um, I would have thought this would have been so much better in medicine, but we see uh, the research telling us that this is not the case with many medical students having had uh, zero or very limited training on eating disorders. Um, the reality is in our communities, uh, access to mental health services is very inadequate. I've been dealing with a number of constituents recently who have acute mental health problems and are being told in Lothian that there's a 10-month wait to see a psychologist. These are people in crisis being told that they've got a 10-month wait. If you're in crisis, you need to see somebody today or tomorrow or at least this week. If somebody says to you, it doesn't matter, we'll see you in nine months' time, then that helps no one. So we need more specialists working at a community level. And in relation to eating disorder, we need people working, on th uh, working with people at a one-to-one -one basis on things like helping them to manage to cope with things like shopping, with meal planning, cooking, with eating a meal, with looking at food in a healthy, positive way, looking at positive exercise, not the exercise that's a negative, uh, and for caring and loving themselves as they are and being comfortable with themselves, but also addressing the trauma that causes it in the first place. So uh, I am pleased that this debate uh, has come forward. I think we may, we may be... Um, as we do in these type of debates, having very uh, good, supportive, consensual speeches for this one day and one week of the year, and then returning back next year 
to do exactly the same while not a lot changes on the ground in our communities. And I hope when we come back next year, we can say, you know what? Services that we provide to people with eating disorders are far better than they were when we had this debate last year. Gillian Martin, followed by Alison Harris. Thank you, President Officer. I want to congratulate Emma Harper for securing this important debate. I also want to thank her for taking up the cause in this parliament, as well as Claire Hockey has in, uh, from taking it on from our colleague and friend Dennis Robertson, the former MSP for the Aberdeenshire West, who campaigned so hard on the illnesses that caused uh, eating disorders. Now, I actually want to make, take a little bit of issue with Neil Finlay saying that things will always stay the same, because when Dennis Robertson stood up in this chamber, I made a call for things to get better in regard of raising awareness of this. Things did get better. He was a staunch campaigner and he did make changes. I phoned Dennis last week to let him know that I was speaking in this debate to talk about how he raised awareness and the importance of keeping that awareness high. And, and, and as has been mentioned before, you all know Dennis and his wife Anne lost their daughter Caroline, who suffered from anorexia nervosa throughout her adolescence and into early adulthood. And uh, as James Donald has said, last week was the, the eighth anniversary of Caroline's passing. I want to pay tribute to all the work that Dennis has done to bring agencies and individuals in this area to work together more collaboratively to provide support to families and other people affected by eating disorders. And Dennis was very clear in our conversation that he does not think the phrase eating disorder is in itself inadequate. It is a psychological illness. Eating disorders are not just about the relationship with food itself, but about anxiety, often an attempt to control one thing in your life when you feel other things are beyond your control. Anorexia nervosa, as we know, is a condition which very often finds its victims when they are in puberty. Withdrawal from family life, irritability, secretive, is part and parcel of the things that parents accept as a normal part of adolescence. So early signs of anorexia can be hidden in amongst that behaviour. And although many young women are victims, as many people have mentioned, young men are increasingly as susceptible. Young men are as vulnerable to the body image problems that the media exacerbates. And of course, as Emma Harper and others have mentioned, the illness can uh, be with a person throughout their entire life. So we shouldn't just be looking at the services available for young people. But withdrawing, getting back to adolescents, withdrawing from their own social scenes making excuses for not meeting friends, not engaging in things other people their age are enjoying, and spending all their time alone is not normal. These behaviours, coupled with obsessive behaviour around eating or over-exercising, missing school for weeks on end, that's not a normal part of teenage life. And these can be indications that something serious is starting to take hold. And I guess one of the biggest worries as a parent, knowing something is wrong is, is knowing where to turn. Uh, Dennis Robertson said in his contribution something that directly relates to this year's uh, campaign against discrimination and stereotyping. He said in 2012, our general practitioners and other medical professionals need to recognise that when a young person goes to their surgery, whether with their parents or their friend, their condition is not to be dismissed as a teenage fad. Awareness around eating disorders amongst those primary care professionals and the teachers and educational support professionals who see these young people every day is absolutely vital. And every time I stand up in this chamber talking about mental health, I always want to use these debates as an opportunity to direct people who may be listening to the support available. Because what we say in these debates may just be the signpost someone needs to get help. Many people have mentioned BEAT, a fantastic website, fantastic resource with lots of information on identifying the early signs, first-hand testimony from people and regionally tailored signposting. And in my area, Grampian CAMS have their own dis eating disorder team and I know that eating disorders are a priority issue for quick referral to CAMS in the North East. And NEEDS, which stands for the North East Eating Disorders Support, have teams for both those in recovery and their families. And I'll be putting links to all of them on my Facebook when I put my speech up later. But finally, just in the last few seconds, I want to mention something that I've been campaigning against, also in relation to suicide prevention. And that's the fact that search engines need to do more to remove content that promotes self-harm. Just like pro-suicide sites, the internet is distressingly awash with pro-anorexia and bulimia sites. There are websites that uh, promote methods of extreme weight loss, glamorise the diseases, 
um, and, and give excuses for people they can use to hide their uh, conditions from those that are around them that love them. Um, support agencies should not be having to pay to have their sites appear in a search before these pro, as, as they're called, pro-ANA sites. And just like I did in my campaigning with regard to uh, pro-suicide sites, I'll be writing to the major search engines to ask what their policy is with regard to pro-ANA sites. Content is dangerous and I believe should be removed, and if it's not, it should be way down the list in the search results. I've run out of time. I want to thank Emma Harper once again, presiding officer. The last of the open debate contributions is from Alison Harris. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd also like to thank Emma Harper for bringing this debate to the Chamber today. As my party's <coughs> spokesperson for children and young people, I welcome the focus on young people in this motion. Eating disorders can affect anyone and everyone. This is a growing problem affecting many people's lives, especially young people. There is a wide range of eating disorders, far more than just anorexia and bulimia, which were the two I was most aware of when growing up, and I will discuss this later on. Eating disorders affect so many people in many different ways. I can't stand here without mentioning the problem of weight gain and obesity and the daily struggles people have with this. People truly struggle with their weight and eating, whether under eating or overeating, and I feel we do need more research perhaps into the effects of a person's metabolism, I can't say that, metabolism on eating disorders. Remember, take an intervention at that point. No, take an intervention. Um, are you going to correct her pronunciation? Yes, that's <laughs> metabolism, sorry. Brian oh, Whittle. Far be it from me, Deputy Presenting Officer. I just wanted to know if the member would agree with me that um, uh, when we're using language here, it's perfectly possible to be overweight and malnourished at the same time. And we need to change the language away from talking about diet and start talking about nutrition. Alison Harris. I thank the member for that intervention. Yes, I think he has a very valid point, and it's something that seems quite strange to say, but yes, you're absolutely correct. I think nutrition is very, very important. Overall, I think it's all about being healthy and having and just being health, health and well-being. I believe encouraging balance and a healthy attitude to food from an early age can help in preventing the development of eating disorders. The motion mentions the charity BEAT, which aims to beat eating disorders. Their website provides useful information on what eating disorders are and the effects that they can have. It also offers tips on how to spot the signs of an eating disorder, from the easier to notice signs, like an obsession with food or exercise, to the more subtle signals, such as someone's distorted views on body size, problems in concentrating or frequent trips to the toilet after meals. This reinforces the importance of moving past and away from old stereotypes. In the past, the term eating disorder would usually make you think of a teenage girl with anorexia or bulimia trying to be a certain body weight or shape. In fact, most people with eating disorders are not underweight. Rising levels of obesity, especially in young people, are worrying too, because if you're overweight when you're young, you're more likely to have weight-related problems later in life. There are far more deceiting disorders than, as I said previously, anorexia and bulimia. Obsessive, emotional or binge eating can be hard to spot, but just as uncontrollable for the sufferer as the more well-known disorders. I, I do think it's important to move past old stereotypes because, as I previously said, eating disorders can affect anyone. And we're seeing a growing number of boys and men experiencing them too. When I was growing up, people would say it was the airbrushing of people in magazines that was affecting our self-image. But I have grave concerns with the way eating disorders are now being affected by the world in which we live, dominated by social media. Back in the day, you captured the moment in a photograph, moved on, and you didn't find out how you looked until it was actually developed. Now we double and triple check photos in our, uh, well, photos in our phones, taking more and more until we get one we like. And I bet everyone in this chamber, including me, now does that. But I do worry that this does have a negative effect, especially on young children, because everything is now about how they look and how they will be perceived by their friends, instead of focusing on actually having fun. On the more extreme end of social media, effects of our so-called pro-Anna and pro-Mia groups, as Gillian Martin mentioned, these groups often consist of teenagers who congratulate each other on their anorexia or bulimia and create group rules around daily calorie intake, fasting challenges and compulsory weekly weigh-ins, 
often without their parents even knowing they exist. And I think this is truly frightening. These young people often find comfort in finding others who are going through the same thing as they are, but without professional help, this can make matters far worse. To conclude, the motion focuses on young people and a growing number of young people whose lives are affected by eating disorders need help. Help can take many forums, but I welcome the chance to mark Eating Disorders Awareness Week by supporting this motion in the hopes of raising awareness and understanding. Thank you. Uh, due to the length of, of some of the speeches, um, if we wish to hear the Minister, I'm happy to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. Can I ask Emma Harper to move the motion? Uh, I move the motion. The question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? <laughs> That's agreed. And I call Claire Hawkey to respond for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer, and I promise I won't speak for 30 minutes. I'm sure members will be relieved. Can I first acknowledge the BEAT Ambassadors here in the gallery today and acknowledge their work during Eating Disorders Week and right throughout the year? Um, I'm very pleased to respond on behalf of the Scottish Government. And this debate has become, as we've heard, an annual fixture to mark Eating Disorders Awareness Week. And I think that's important on many levels. It shows us we are all taking eating disorders seriously and are committed to raising their profile across Scotland. And I want to pay tribute to a few people in particular for this. Firstly, I want to thank my colleague um, Emma Harper for lodging the motion and for continuing to focus minds on how important this subject is. This includes her continued work to raise awareness of diabolemia. And we know that diabetes is quite commonly a comorbid condition with eating disorders and it's an incredibly serious issue. And Emma Harper's motion today rightly reminds us of this. And in addition, I too wish to honour our former colleague, Dennis Robertson. I'm sure that no one in the chamber is a stranger to Dennis's own tragic experiences of the devastating effects of eating disorders. This was one of the main drivers behind me lodging my own motion in the debate last year. And as I said then, I want to reassure Dennis that there are many others who will continue to fight for the right help and support to be available across Scotland. Last year's debate focused on ensuring everyone who needs help and support for an eating disorder receives it as soon as possible. We know that early diagnosis is vital in treating and recovering from any form of eating disorder, and eating disorders are acutely serious conditions, but it is possible for affected people to recover and maintain healthy and productive lives. The theme of this year's Awareness Week is tackling discrimination and breaking down the stereotypes associated with eating disorders. Eating disorders do not discriminate and anyone can be affected by them. They are serious illnesses which can change lives. And if there is one message coming out of today's debate, it should be this one. We also know that eating disorders are highly complex and can manifest in many different ways. There are multiple different classifications across the DSM, that's the Diagnostic Statistical Manual Edition 5, and ICD-10, the International Classification of Diseases. And these conditions are not always about weight loss, as we've heard from other contributions. Binge eating disorder, for example, can be just as devastating as anorexia or bulimia. And that's why it's critical that we have the right help and specialist services. We will commission a needs assessment of CAMS inpatient provision in Scotland. This will look at capacity within the inpatient system, as well as community provision, patient flow through the system, and issues such as delayed discharge, looking, into, uh, at, looking at provision for patients with eating disorders. Work is also going on through the Children and Young People's Mental Health Task Force. Emma Harper's motion alludes to the importance of this. And one of the task force strand of work is to look at specialist services covering young people with serious mental health conditions who need help. This is a key part of the picture for eating disorders. I also want to mention two announcements that the Scottish Government has made to mark Eating Disorders Awareness Week 2019. And I'm very pleased that we've been able to put forward improvements which will make a real difference to people's lives. Firstly, yesterday we have relaunched our digital peer support service, which was created in collaboration between NHS Lothian and BEAT. 
The relaunch included the addition of a telephone coaching service for parents and carers. And this project was initially launched last year and those who took part found this type of support incredibly helpful. One young person said, the service allowed me to realise that my support buddy had felt the same way. She's battled through to become a much happier person. It gives me hope. This is proof of how incredibly important peer support can be for those with any type of mental illness. And this feedback is why we have committed to the project for a further three years. And I want to make sure that those diagnosed with an eating disorder and their families are supported and given hope of recovery, whatever their circumstances. Additionally, at the start of this week, I was pleased to announce the first ever Scotland specific guidelines on the management and treatment of eating disorders. And this will be produced by the Scottish Intercollegiate Guide Guidelines Network, SIGN. SIGN will shortly begin work on these guidelines, which are different from the DSM and ICD-10 ICD diagnostic classifications that I mentioned previously. They will provide practical, specific detail on how to address common issues and will focus on the particular cultural and geographical needs that exist in Scotland. And we want to ensure that everyone is seen on the basis of clinical need and they are prioritised accordingly and is seen by the most appropriate services. When the side guidelines are published, we will have a Scotland specific blueprint and we will expect it to be followed carefully. I think we've heard some really um, interesting uh, contributions to today's debate. Um, Emma Harper, obviously, who, who motioned this as we're debating. Um, I agree with you that social media is so important to mental well-being. And we know this is an issue in particular for, for young people. And, uh, and it was an issue that was also raised by Alison Harris. Um, and that's, that's because young people themselves have told us this. And we've committed to producing guidance um, and are happy to uh, ensure that it covers eating disorders um, um, advice too. Um, Brian Whittle spoke about the pressures on young people and um, his own family experience of bulimia. Rona Mackay reminded of her, as of her contribution last year and something that I remember very well, her talking about friends that she had lost through eating disorders. Um, Neil Finlay's contribution about his, um, his concern about early intervention and about his uh, constituents' own experiences of accessing services. Um, and I think those, are, those were really important contributions. Uh, James Dornan, um, of course, reminding us that men and boys are also affected by eating disorders. And Gillian Martin about um, the importance of raising awareness about eating disorders and the signs and symptoms of eating disorders. All very important contributions, I think, to a really worthwhile debate. Yes, Mr Finlay. Neil Finlay. Yeah, just in relation to the point I made in terms of targets, is she going to mention that in her speech? Clearly. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think um, in, in relation to that, I think Mr Finlay raised uh, an issue about the target that has been set down in England, a target which is, has not been met. Um, we want to ensure that everyone is seen on the basis of clinical need, um, that they're prioritised accordingly and seen by the most appropriate services. When the sign guidelines are published, and I think that's really key that the sign guidelines are written by clinicians, um, that we have a Scotland-specific blueprint, and we'll expect that as a government to be followed very carefully. Um, Presiding officer, I and many others across this chamber feel very strongly about this topic. The level of interest in today's debate reflects that, and it's up to us to ensure that eating disorders have the profile and public understanding that they deserve, and that everyone suffering with this most serious of conditions is able to get the help that they need. Thank you. That concludes the debate and this meeting is closed.